Oh, we're on. So, <clears throat> we're playing the Playboy Jazz Festival at the Hollywood Bowl in uh, Hollywood. And it's, um, Hollywood Bowl is basically the side of a mountain. They put seats in the mountain at the very bottom. They put a beautiful stage with a band shell. Just type it in and you'll see it. Very historic. Everybody's played there. The Beatles, the Stones, every orchestra, everybody. It's a home of the L.A. Philharmonic. And uh, when you play the Playboy Festival, <clears throat> right in front of the stage is uh, Hugh Hefner and all his bunnies or whoever he's got hanging out. So, you know, it's, you're, you're trying to play. Here you're, you're on a bus with a bunch of guys for weeks, and then you're playing and you're looking at Hugh Hefner and these bunnies, and it's summertime, and they're all drinking and just hanging out, and there's Hugh Hefner and... You know, you're trying to play and, you know, pretend you're, <laughs> ooh, G minor chord, yeah, man, you know, it's very surreal. Bill Cosby is the MC. everybody's walking around backstage, so it's a real, <clears throat> everyone was there, it was, well, everyone, uh, Weather Report was there, so you see Wayne Shorter walking around, there's Peter Erskine walking around, Herbie Hancock's walking around backstage, and, uh, and a, a slew of other people, Nina Simone, all kinds of, Kenny G, be, just when he started, he used to be with Jeff Lorber, and just when he started out on his own, he was, he was, uh, he was at that festival, so it was packed, so you go into the restroom, you go in the restroom, and the restroom is so big, the whole, the, the building is basically the backstage area, and because it's a band shell, the whole design has sort of a curve to it, so when you go into the restroom, at least the way I remembered it, it was a big long room that was curved. It was almost like you had a long shoe box and you bent it. And I remember that, not that this means anything, but <clears throat> when you're in that room, I just it, there were just like urinals on the wall forever. There must have been like 70 of them, and it kind of disappeared into the horizon because the room sort of bent. And uh, then I realized it was for the Philharmonic. You know, when they're playing and they have like a hundred people on stage and they have to take a ten minute break. All right, so we're using a restroom and then I go over to the sink to wash my hands. And right next to me is this guy. He kind of looks familiar. I don't know who he is. And somebody says to him, All right, Curtis, I'll see you outside. And he says, Okay. And I'm thinking, Oh my God. I turned to him and I asked him, I said, are you Curtis Fuller from Bonus? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, my God. I said, man, you're one of my heroes. Are you kidding? I said, you don't know me. You don't know me from Adam. Don't. But I said, I know you're playing. And I grew up listening to your playing. You're, you're like one of my heroes. Man, you sound great. And I said, on that Blue Train record, right? on that Blue Train record where you play with Coltrane and Lee Morgan, my God, it sounds, you sound great. And Moments Notice, the song Moments Notice, so let me pause just for a second. For those of you who might not know this, some songs are easier to learn than other songs. It's just the construction of the song. Some songs are pretty simple. Some songs have a real sophisticated construction. And when you solo on a certain song, you have to really study it to kind of get a handle on it because it's like going through a neighborhood that you don't know. You have to really... Has a lot of ins and outs and what have yous, you know, <laughs> like like a big Lebowski tune, what have yous and whatnot, and you know, new stuff has come to light. Anyway, um, this tune "Moments Notice" was tricky, and when Coltrane wrote it, it was one of those tunes that you wanted to look at, you know. So anyway, we're back in the bathroom, and I and I'm, I said, "Man, I love you on that Blue Train record," and. Uh, you know, you're playing on moment's notice, and he snapped. He kind of went, he, he like shifted gear like someone flipped a switch, and he said, yeah, let me tell you something, about, let me tell you something about moment's notice. I don't want to hear anybody record that tune after they worked on it for six weeks or worked on it for six months. I want to hear them sight read it and record it like I had to do when we recorded it. That's what I want to see. I don't want to hear anybody practice that thing. Anybody could practice it. I was like, whoa. <laughs> okay, and uh, so and I, I I forgot what I said. I may have said, "Oh, so you didn't have a chance to look at it?" And he's like, "I don't have a chance to look at anything." Why do you think I went up to John Coltrane? I went up to John and said, "John, you can't lay this on us in a moment's notice." And he said, "John went, hey, that's a great title. 
And then Curtis says, why do you think they call it Moments Notice? That was my, I told John, that's why he called it that. I don't want to hear anybody play that after they've been practicing it. <sighs> Sight read it. <laughs> there you go. That's something you're not going to find in the history books. That was a Curtis Fuller, great player. Just go to YouTube and type in John Coltrane Moments Notice and you'll hear it. Great player. Great guy. Oh, boy. He was great. And he was upset. 